Chapter Four of the Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches, a Romance of Pendle Forest, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Introduction, The Last Abbot of Whaley. Chapter Four, The Malediction. The captive ecclesiastics, together with the strong escort by which they were attended, under the command of John Bradill, the high sheriff of the county, had passed the previous night at Whitwell, in Boland Forest, and the abbot, before setting out on his final journey, was permitted to spend an hour in prayer in a little chapel on an adjoining hill, overlooking a most picturesque portion of the forest, the beauties of which were enhanced by the windings of the Hodder, one of the loveliest streams in Lancashire. His devotions performed, Paslew, attended by a guard, slowly descended the hill, and gazed his last on scenes familiar to him almost from infancy. Noble trees, which now looked like old friends, to whom he was bidding an eternal adieu, stood around him. Beneath them, at the end of a glade, couched a herd of deer, which started off at the sight of the intruders, and made him envy their freedom and fleetness, as he followed them in thought to their solitudes. At the foot of a steep rock ran the hodder, making the pleasant music of other days, as it dashed over the pebbly bed, and recalling times when, free from all care, he had strayed by the wood-fringed banks, to listen to the pleasant sound of running waters, and to watch the shining pebbles beneath them, and the swift trout and dainty umber glancing past. A bitter pang was it to part with scenes so fair, and the abbot spoke no word, nor even looked up, until, passing Little Mitten, he came in sight of Whaley Abbey. Then, collecting all his energies, he prepared for the shock he was about to endure. But nerved as he was, his firmness was sorely tried when he beheld the stately pile, once his own, now gone from him and his for ever. He gave one fond glance towards it, and then, painfully averting his gaze, recited in a low voice this supplication. Miserere mei, Deus secundam magnam misericordiam tuam, et secundum multitudinem miserationum tuarum, dele inequitatem meam, amplios lava me ab iniquitate mea, et apicato meo bunda me. But other thoughts and other emotions crowded upon him when he beheld the groups of his old retainers advancing to meet him, men, women, and children pouring forth loud lamentations, prostrating themselves at his feet, and deploring his doom. The abbot's fortitude had a severe trial here, and the tears sprung to his eyes. The devotion of these poor people touched him more sharply than the severity of his adversaries. "'Bless ye, bless ye, my children,' he cried. "'Repine not for me, for I bear my cross with resignation. "'It is for me to bewail your lot, "'much fearing that the flock I have so long and so zealously tended "'will fall into the hands of other and less heedful pastors, "'or still worse of devouring wolves. "'Bless ye, my children, and be comforted. "'Think of the end of Abbot Pastew, and for what he suffered.' "'Think that he was a traitor to the king, and took up arms in a rebellion against him,' cried the sheriff, riding up and speaking in a loud voice, "'and that for his heinous offences he was justly condemned to death.' Murmurs arose at this speech, but they were instantly checked by the escort. "'Think charitably of me, my children,' said the abbot, "'and the blessed virgin keep you steadfast in your faith. Benedicite.' "'Be silent, traitor, I command thee!' cried the sheriff, striking him with his gauntlet in the face. The abbot's pale cheek burnt crimson, and his eye flashed fire, but he controlled himself, and answered meekly, "'Thou didst not speak in such wise, John Bradill, when I saved thee from the flood. "'Which flood thou thyself caused to burst forth by devilish arts?' rejoined the sheriff. "'I owe thee little for the service.' "'If for naught else thou deservest death for thy evil doings on that night.' The abbot made no reply, 
for Bradil's allusion conjured up a sombre train of thought within his breast, awakening apprehensions which he could neither account for nor shake off. Meanwhile, the cavalcade slowly approached the northeast gateway of the abbey, passing through crowds of kneeling and sorrowing bystanders, but so deeply was the abbot engrossed by the one dread idea that possessed him, that he saw them not, and scarce heard their woeful lamentations. All at once the cavalcade stopped, and the sheriff rode on to the gate, in the opening of which some ceremony was observed. Then it was that Paslew raised his eyes, and beheld standing before him a tall man, with a woman beside him, bearing an infant in her arms. The eyes of the pair were fixed upon him with vindictive exultation. He would have averted his gaze, but an irresistible fascination withheld him. "'Thou seest all is prepared,' said Demdike, coming up close to the mule on which Paslew was mounted, and pointing to the gigantic gallows looming above the abbey walls. "'Wilt thou now accede to my request?' And then he added, significantly, "'On the same terms as before?' The abbot understood his meaning well. Life and freedom were offered him by a being whose power to accomplish his promise he did not doubt. The struggle was hard, but he resisted the temptation, and answered firmly, "'No!' "'Then die the felon death thou meritest!' cried Bess fiercely, "'and I will glut mine eyes with the spectacle!' Incensed beyond endurance, the abbot looked sternly at her, and raised his hand in denunciation. The action and the look were so appalling that the affrighted woman would have fled if her husband had not restrained her. "'By the holy patriarchs and prophets, by the prelates and confessors, by the doctors of the church, by the holy abbots, monks, and eremites, who dwelt in solitudes, in mountains, and in caverns, by the holy martyrs, who suffered torture and death for their faith, I curse thee, witch!' cried Paslew. "'May the malediction of heaven and all its hosts alight on the head of thy infant!' "'O oh, holy abbot!' shrieked Bess, breaking from her husband, and flinging herself at Paslew's feet. "'Curse me, if thou wilt, but spare my innocent child. Save it, and we will save thee!' "'Avoid thee, wretched and impious woman,' rejoined the abbot. "'I have pronounced the dread anathema, and it cannot be recalled. Look at the dripping garments of thy child. In blood it has been baptised, and through blood-stained paths shall its course be taken.' "'Ah!' shrieked Bess, noticing for the first time the ensanguined condition of the infant's attire. "'Cuthbert's blood! Oh!' "'Listen to me, wicked woman,' pursued the abbot, as if filled with a prophetic spirit. "'Thy child's life shall be long, beyond the ordinary term of woman, but it shall be a life of woe and ill.' "'Oh, stay him, stay him, or I shall die!' cried Bess but the wizard could not speak. A greater power than his own apparently overmastered him. "'Children shall she have,' continued the abbot, "'and children's children, but they shall be a race doomed and accursed, a brood of adders that the world shall flee from and crush. A thing accursed and shunned by her fellows shall thy daughters be, evil reputed and evil doing. No hand to help her, no lip to bless her, life a burden, and death, long, long in coming, finding her in a dismal dungeon. Now depart from me, and trouble me no more. Bess made a motion as if she would go, and then, turning partly round, dropped heavily on the ground. Demdike caught the child ere she fell. "'Thou hast killed her!' he cried to the abbot. "'A stronger voice than mine hath spoken, if it be so,' rejoined Paslew. "'Fuge miserime, fuge malefice, quia judiata serratus.' At this moment the trumpet again sounded, and the cavalcade being put in motion, the abbot and his fellow-captives passed through the gate. Dismounting from their mules within the court, before the chapter-house, the captive ecclesiastics, preceded by the sheriff, were led to the principal chamber of the structure, 
where the Earl of Derby awaited them, seated in the Gothic carved oak chair formerly occupied by the abbots of Whaley on the occasion of conferences or elections. The Earl was surrounded by his officers, and the chamber was filled with armed men. The abbot slowly advanced towards the Earl. His deportment was dignified and firm, ever majestic. The exaltation of spirit, occasioned by the interview with Demdike and his wife, had passed away, and was succeeded by a profound calm. The hue of his cheek was livid, but otherwise he seemed wholly unmoved. The ceremony of delivering up the bodies of the prisoners to the Earl was gone through by the sheriff, and their sentences were then read aloud by a clerk. After this, the Earl, who had hitherto remained covered, took off his cap, and in a solemn voice spoke, "'John Paslew, sometime abbot of Whaley, but now an attainted and condemned felon, and John Eastgate and William Haydock, formerly brethren of the same monastery, and confederates with him in crime, ye have heard your doom. To-morrow you shall die the ignominious death of traitors. But the king, in his mercy, having regard not so much to the heinous nature of your offences towards his sovereign majesty, as to the sacred offices you once held, and of which you have been shamefully deprived, is graciously pleased to remit that part of your sentence, whereby ye are condemned to be quartered alive, willing that the hearts which conceived so much malice and violence against him should cease to beat within your own bosoms, and that the arms which were raised in rebellion against him should be interred in one common grave with the trunks to which they belong. "'God save the high and puissant king, Henry the Eighth, and free him from all traitors!' cried the clerk. "'We humbly thank his majesty for his clemency,' said the abbot, amid the profound silence that ensued. "'And pray you, my good lord, when you shall write to the king concerning us, to say to his majesty that we died penitent of many and grave offences, among the which is chiefly that of having taken up arms unlawfully against him, but that we did so solely with the view of freeing his highness from evil counsellors, and of re-establishing our holy church, for the which we would willingly die, if our death might in any ways profit it. Amen! exclaimed Father Eastgate, who stood with his hands crossed upon his breast, close behind Pastew. "'The abbot hath uttered my sentiments.' "'He hath not uttered mine,' cried Father Haydock. "'I ask no grace from the bloody Herodias, and will accept none. "'What I have done I would do again, were the past to return. "'Nay, I would do more. "'I would find a way to reach the tyrant's heart, "'and thus free our church from its worst enemy, "'and the land from a ruthless oppressor.' "'Remove him,' said the earl, the vile traitor shall be dealt with as he merits. For you, he added, as the order was obeyed, and addressing the other prisoners, and especially you, John Pastew, who have shown some compunction for your crimes, and to prove to you that the king is not the ruthless tyrant he hath been just represented, I hereby, in his name, promise you any boon which you may ask consistently with your situation. What favour would you have shown you? The abbot reflected for a moment. Speak thou, John Eastgate, said the Earl of Derby, seeing that the abbot was occupied in thought. If I may proffer a request, my lord, replied the monk, it is that our poor distraught brother, William Haydock, be spared the quartering block. He meant not what he said. Mm, well, be it as thou wilt replied the earl, bending his brows, though he ill deserves such grace. Now, John Pastlew, what wouldst thou? Thus addressed, the abbot looked up. I would have made the same request as my brother John Eastgate, if he had not anticipated me, my lord, said Pastlew. But since his petition is granted, I would, on my own part, 
entreat that mass be said for us in the convent church. Many of the brethren are without the abbey, and, if permitted, will assist at its performance. I know not if I shall not incur the king's displeasure in assenting, replied the Earl of Derby, after a little reflection, but I will hazard it. Mass for the dead shall be said in the church at midnight, and all the brethren who choose to come thither shall be permitted to assist at it. They will attend, I doubt not, for it will be the last time the rites of the Romish church will be performed in these walls. They shall have all required for the ceremonial. Heaven's blessings on you, my lord, said the abbot. But first pledge me your sacred word, said the earl, by the holy office you once held, and by the saints in whom you trust, that this concession shall not be made the means of any attempt at flight. I swear it, replied the abbot earnestly, and also I swear it, added Father Eastgate. Enough, said the earl, I will give the necessary orders. Notice of the celebration of Mass at midnight shall be proclaimed without the abbey. Now remove the prisoners. Upon this the captive ecclesiastics were led forth. Father Eastgate was taken to a strong room in the lower part of the chapter-house, where all acts of discipline had been performed by the monks, and where the knotted lash, the spiked girdle, and the hair shirt had once hung, while the abbot was conveyed to his old chamber, which had been prepared for his reception, and there left alone. End of chapter 4